What makes a king? Is it wealth, fame, power, a fancy crenellating castle, or an even fancier crenellating beard? Is it marrying an Amazonian empress? Is it making friends with an octopus that one time? Or is it the fact that despite being a 78 year old man, there isn't a single person in this world who would even think of challenging you to combat without promptly soiling their undergarments and having everyone around them call them pee pee poo pants? This is the story of a man who stood directly behind the greatest king to have ever lived. A man who chose to remain in the darker shadow cast by the brightest light. A man largely forgotten by the world, but largely remembered by those he owes his various gambling debts to. And in the eyes of fictional pirate historians, he is quite possibly the most important living figure today. So the question of what makes a king is actually very interesting. In fact, that's one of the core examinations of One Piece. Luffy wants to become the pirate king, but, but what even is that? Not even Roger properly understood the title that was thrown upon him as the initial pirate king. But what makes the Dark King is even more fascinating. Silver's Rayleigh was born in an unnamed town on an unnamed island in an as of yet surprisingly unnamed world. You'd think the planet would have a name by now, but here we are. This is all very much in the spirit of what it is to be the Dark King though, where the details of Roger's life are known far and wide, Ray Lee's are decidedly more short and narrow, as his history has taken up residence in this here big old question mark. But here's what we do know. When Ray Lee was roughly the age of young, he had a very misfortunate life, at one stage culminating in his house burning down. In response, Ray Lee stole a boat to live on and became a career alcoholic, a vice that would never quite disappear. In fact, it would even be joined by its two best friends gambling and womanizing. Ray Lee is what we in Australia would call a bit of a mad lad and what everyone else would call, hey son and or daughter, stay away from that man over there. He even sold himself into slavery on at least one occasion, but you know, we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves there. Rayleigh's life at this point could be best described as a broken log pose, because neither of them were taking him anywhere. However, a chance meeting with one man was about to change everything. And you know, it's always interesting how fate just decides to wait until you reach rock bottom before it decides to step in. It's almost as if fate is a bit of a sadist. But standing there before Rayleigh was a straw-hatted light, strong enough to pierce the rum-fueled haze cloud surrounding him. A man whose smile could serve as a literal dictionary definition definition of the word hope, capable of creating laughter more infectious than diseases crafted by cyborg dinosaurs. That man's name was Goldie Roger. And he said, this meeting is fate, Rayleigh. Let's turn the world upside down together. Join me on a journey, most piratesome. And seeing this one and only opportunity to completely turn his life around, Rayleigh replied, no, and furthermore, it wasn't a great start. However, what Rayleigh said and what Roger heard were two entirely different things. Rayleigh effectively said, yeah, nah. But what Roger heard was, nah, yeah. And one missing scene later, these two would set sail, forming the foundation that would result in the birth of the Roger Pirates and two of this world's most prolific kings. And this isn't canon, but I would like to think that the very first Roger Pirate ship was Rayleigh's stolen houseboat. Throughout the years, the Roger Pirates would gather quite the fearsome crew, including the allegedly legendary Scopa Gabon. Some do dude named Seagull and like 20 other almost weirdly irrelevant characters. That doesn't matter though, because at the core of everything was the relationship between Roger and Ray Lee, which was described by both as a partnership. And the terms of the partnership agreement were as follows. The deal was that Roger gets to be the captain, name the crew, retain all merchandising rights and make all of the decisions. Meanwhile, Ray Lee had to obey unquestioningly and bring all of his captain's madness to fruition. In modern contract law, this would also be known as the Luffy Zorro terms of agreement. And this hierarchy was also very much living up to their metallic namesakes. Gold is more coveted, but silver is far more practical and useful. Meanwhile, copper is, well, copper is also there. Still very useful, we just don't like to talk about it as much. But under the sturdy operational guidance of Silver's Rayleigh, the Roger Pirates rose to power faster than Kizaru completing a crossword, which is to say moderate to slowly, because Kizaru, well, he's not a particularly quick thinker. The Roger Pirates didn't have what I like to call the Luffy fast track. It took them quite literally decades of sailing through the Grand Line and the New World multiple times over to make make the same sort of progress as the Straw Hats have. And furthermore, Rayleigh didn't even have any fancy fruit powers to make the journey easier. In fact, as far as we're aware, none of the Roger Pirates did, at least none at this stage. Because eventually a clown would deep throat a pineapple and change everything, but that is a story for not this story. So Rayleigh had to do things old school, which I believe back then was just school. In essence, Rayleigh was a sword specialist slash enthusiast who over the course of the series has been seen wielding at least four different blades of all different styles, from katana to round pommel, and also 
a cutlass, which Ray Lee used to cut more. He was also known to frequently switch between being a one sword wielder and a dual sword wielder. Depends how he felt at the time, I guess. In fact, sometimes he wasn't in the mood for either. According to the anime, Ray Lee sometimes went completely swordless and stopped a young Marco the Phoenix with a single hockey coated finger of doom. Speaking of, I guess we should address that because Ray Lee is one of the greatest hockey masters to have ever lived. Having completely mastered the trio of observation, armament, and conqueror's hockey, Ray Lee is what the Spanish would refer to as El hombre que usa tres cosas ficticias. There were only maybe a handful of people who could even stand up to Ray Lee, much less defeat him. And so the Roger Pirates continued to sail, dominating all challenges in their way through various punch fighting and cut slicing, until 38 years before the year that it is now, a man named Rocks attacked a much larger rock named God Valley. And this would serve as the historic battlefield where Goldie Roger would team up with renowned Marine Monkey D. Garp to defeat the strongest pirate crew to have ever existed. However, it's currently unknown what, if any, involvement Ray Lee had on God Valley. But what's more important is what happened when Roger returned to the crew. Ray Lee, my platonic life partner. Roger, it always sounds weird when you say it like that. And don't worry about that life partner because it's about to get much more weirder. Ray Lee, I'm pregnant. Metaphorically, that is. My mind is pregnant with information to tell you. Ray Lee, congratulations. You're going to be a father. And you're going to do it right now because I've just adopted a redhead and a clown. So I'll just leave these things to you because I've, I've got pirate stuff. In truth, Baby Shanks was found in a treasure chest looted from God Valley. And while Buggy's origins are still unconfirmed at this stage, there is the potential that he was also found there. Either way, Ray Lee took to parenting much like he took to alcoholism, which is to say surprisingly easily and extremely seriously. And Ray Lee was certainly the more stern parent, the bad cop to Roger's good cop, or in a more modern sense, Roger was the F around parent, whilst Ray Lee was the find out parent. And look, I'm not saying that Roger and Ray Lee had a favorite child, but given that Roger gave the straw hats to Shanks, I'd say that would be a pretty safe bet. But this mostly happy family dynamic would play out for the next 12 years, after which point Roger contracted an incurable disease, prompting the crew to take one last voyage around the world and resulting in the discovery of a secret island housing a secret treasure. A treasure which was apparently hilarious as crap as they named the island Laugh Tail purely in honor of the lols. It would also be through this journey that Rayleigh became one of the rare individuals to learn the true history of the world. And with all of that information, he did nothing, absolutely nothing. Because in his own resigned words, even if I told you everything in history right now, there is nothing you could do about it. But following the discovery of Laugh Tale, Roger became recognized as the Pirate King. And as he reached the apex of his wealth, fame, and power, he immediately disbanded his crew and got himself arrested. A bold strategy, let's see if it pays off. It didn't because Roger was scheduled to be immediately executed and said execution would result in the birth of almost every remarkable figure we now know of in the modern era. However, for Ray Lee, that day marked the end of his era. Following his partner's execution, Ray Lee decided to spend the evening breaking three personal bests, having laughed more, cried more, and drank more than any other single evening. And that, what I can only describe as a fluid extravaganza, was Ray Lee's toast to the new age. Following this, the Dark King did the thing it is that's in his epithet and took up residence in the darkness, well and truly fading from the global consciousness of the world. The very idea of Silver's Ray Lee became something of an urban legend, with reported sightings of him here and there over the years. Which sounds really mysterious and almost a bit demonic, but the reality of Ray Lee's retirement was much more benign and wholesome. He would go on to marry a former Kuja Empress, make friends with an octopus, and did what all of the haters in my comments tell me to do, which is to get a real job. And so Ray Lee took up life as a ship coater on Sabadi Archipelago. And to sum up Ray Lee's new life in his own words, I'm just an ordinary coating craftsman on this island. People call me Ray. And Ray made a lot of money in this business. A lot of money that he then promptly lost due to his crippling gambling addiction. In fact, Ray Lee had a tendency to lose a lot more than he made, with his get out of jail free plan being more accurately referred to as a get into jail plan, as he would repeatedly sell himself into slavery in order to pay off his debts. But because he is the Dark King Silver's Ray Lee, he just kept escaping because who's gonna stop him? At one point, the greatest Marine to have ever lived, Monkey D. Garp, was even informed of Ray Lee's activity and his response was essentially, yeah, look, I'm not touching that and neither should anyone else because you're probably gonna die and I don't want to spend all afternoon scrubbing your remains off the floor. What I want are donuts and rice crackers. So unless the Dark King is made out of donuts and rice crackers, I need you to shut your mouth, then I need you to open my mouth and feed me donuts and rice crackers. I'm paraphrasing a bit, but you get the idea. No matter who you are, you just don't mess with Ray Lee. To put all of that into some perspective, Ray Lee's life and business partner Shaki is also in the business of power scaling. And when Luffy and the Supernovas arrived on Sabadi, she said that Ray Lee was easily 100 times more powerful than any of them. Speaking of, Ray Lee would then go on to meet Luffy in the Straw Hats, but not so much by chance. In fact, several years earlier, Shanks had informed Ray Lee of a young rubberman who now wore Roger's straw 
straw hat. And Rayleigh even ended up defending Luffy from the assault of a Marine Admiral, which is where we were given conclusive evidence that Rayleigh is not a man to be taken lightly because Kizaru tried light and that didn't work. But what truly put Kizaru off was Rayleigh's word sorcery when he said, confusion is what life is all about. A statement which in and of itself is almost deliberately confusing because from Kizaru's perspective, one, why did Rayleigh say that? Two, why did he say it to me? I didn't ask. And three, if life was about confusion, then does that mean that I've never truly known anything? Is life simply a series of facades? Like a red herring onion constantly peeling through thinly veiled layers of lies? And if so, can true clarity only be achieved through death? And it was at this point that Kizaru's mindbrain.exe stopped working and forced him to undergo a hard reset. Even with the Admiral occupied though, complications arose and ensued. The straw hat split up, Luffy did a bit of a prison break, the world did a war, Whitebeard did a death, Ace became a donut, and all the while Rayleigh sat back and watched everything with his never ending glass of rum. And just like how fate waits until you hit rock bottom to step in, this is when Rayleigh would choose to step in. And in retrospect, it's apparent that Rayleigh didn't just learn the true history of the world through his journeys with Roger, but also the future. That's something to always keep in mind. The Dark King knows what is going to happen and vaguely when. And so he approached Luffy after the war on Amazon Lily with the offer to spend two years training him. Why two years? Because that's how long it was gonna take before the thing happened. And so Rayleigh said, let's get down to business. To which Luffy made this face, which I think is the universal F off old man, I am eating face. Also, I think it's a fun note that Rayleigh only knew where to find Luffy because Shaki was clever enough to deduce his location, which gave us another classic Rayleigh quote, women's intuition is a frightening thing, which was almost immediately accompanied by the following statement, I forbid any women to come here while Luffy is training. And so Rayleigh taught Luffy the basics of all three brands of hockey and dumped him on an island with 500 insanely powerful fighting beasts for Luffy to overcome. Because according to Rayleigh, hockey only truly blooms in the heat of fight battling. In fact, Rayleigh only spent about six months of that two years training Luffy personally. After that, he left Luffy and went back to doing the things it is that Rayleigh does. You know, the drinking, the gambling, the womening, etc. But when Luffy and the Straw Hats returned to Sabadee two years later, Rayleigh made sure to bid his people farewell and Rayleigh was met with the same smile that Roger had initially given him all those decades ago. Luffy then promised to become the Pirate King and Rayleigh was flooded with memories of Roger. And so our Dark King remains in the shadows to this very day, watching and waiting for the time that his partner's legacy will be fulfilled. And also doing some other things like scaring Blackbeard that one time on Amazon Lily because Rayleigh's time at the top might be over, but his very own legacy is as powerful as ever.